Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Today, I'm going to talk about, a bit about our ongoing journey from REST to GraphQL, and uh, especially on Android. So we've been refactoring our whole API stuff, migrating from a REST API to a GraphQL one. And it's been quite a journey, and uh, that's the volume two. So I've already given this talk in the past. But as it's a very long journey, we always learn new stuff when refactoring from REST to GraphQL. So I'm going to share a few things about that. To introduce myself, my name is Julien Salvi. I'm the lead Android engineer for a company called Aircall, based in Paris. So we are building a cloud-based phone system for businesses. And as on the side, I'm a Google developer expert for Android, and I mostly develop in shorts. So uh, first, I'm going to set up some, like, the whole context, why we choose GraphQL, and how we set up all the things. Uh, then I'm going to just uh, show a quick introduction how to set up uh, GraphQL inside your Android app, and dig into like, the, like, the return of experience based on the, our GraphQL migration, sharing a lot of good things, bad things, and some surprise we saw along the way. And then I just conclude with a uh, with few resources. All right, let's set up the context. So what's GraphQL? Uh, GraphQL is an open source query language, so you can like uh, query and get some like post things. It's like REST, all the things that you can do with REST with the crude operation, but in the more very type way. It was developed by Facebook and then open source. So there is like three main points like to go with GraphQL. Uh, you have an efficient data retrieval. Uh, like GraphQL is optimized for data fetching. You only fetch what is needed. Uh, so uh, if your schema is well defined and you only want like a few things based on your query, you can get these just few things. You eliminate the overfetching probably on REST. And then also a single endpoint simplicity. You don't have to deal with uh, several endpoints for mi different microservices and so on. So everything uh, you interact is a single endpoint. So with that, you have uh, like uh, uh, some round trips and s you streamline the communication. Uh, and one of the of the big point of GraphQL, there is the strong typing and introspection. So uh, the typing is very important in GraphQL. So you can like play on the nullability or not. If you want an int, it will always be an int. If, it, if it's a nullable int, it always be a nullable int. So you know what you are fetching, and you know in the end what you're going to get. And also, with the schema, you, know, you also have like the, the documentation on the go with that. You don't need like, a, an extra open API uh, schema and so on. Your schema is also the documentation. OK, so why we move to GraphQL at our call? Uh, we experiment some like not issue but limitation with our REST API. Uh, there was like some scaling issue. We wanted like to break our big monolith into uh, some microservices, but it was not modular enough and has some scaling issue. And uh, we wanted like to go to a serverless alternative and uh, like uh, our stack mainly relies on uh, on AWS uh, at Aircall. So. Uh, we want to use a lot of uh, serverless things, and we wanted like to find this alternative for our REST API. Also, we wanted like to have uh, an efficient um, uh, an efficient data ad aggregation, uh, so like all the front ends know what you, what we get uh, because our REST API lacks of a bit of documentation and stuff like that. There, there were like some uh, issues at the beginning. When you start with a startup and grow from like uh, uh, like uh, a few person to now like more than 200 person in the tech, you lose some stuff along the way. Uh, and while migrating from REST to our new kind of API, uh, we wanted like a minimum description, uh, so like uh, we cannot say to the client, okay, uh, 
uh, we're going to migrate to a new services, but uh, it's going to be easy. sometimes we're going to like uh, shut down the service for a few hours, a few days. No, it's not not possible like that. So by doing so, we're going to keep the REST API and then having the new stuff in the GraphQL API and migrating all the endpoints along the way. So the key point of GraphQL for us, it was like, uh, as I explained, the, the efficient data loading. So getting what you want. The federated also GraphQL API, uh, like it enables independent development deployment. So each like feature team in, uh, in our, uh, all our backend teams can develop the endpoint, the query, the mutation on their side and push part of the schema without breaking everything. So improving maintainability and scalability of our system. The strong typing, getting really what you want. The da data aggregation. So uh, like uh, the, you can fetch multiple resources in a single request. That's kind of a very good thing here. Avoiding like uh, multiple requests, uh, especially on mobile when uh, you are focused on really the performances and not making like uh, other requests to think about the, the battery life and the performance on the device. Also, a good point of GraphQL is the, the real-time com uh, communication. Uh, by doing so, uh, GraphQL exposes a subscription, which is kind of a web socket uh, exposed to the, on the client side. And you can open this web socket and communicate with your service. So like uh, very efficient for, for us, we are, we are using that for um, getting SMS and MMS in real time. So when you receive a new uh, SMS, it goes into that web socket and we are notifying in real time. So that's a very good thing. And also GraphQL reduced the latency. Uh, it can support like uh, uh, multiple batch chain requests. Uh, so uh, in like a uh, lot of requests duplicated stuff in the, in the network. So overall it uh, improved the performances. Okay, so uh, we use GraphQL. As I said, the, uh, all the air call text relies on AWS. So on the backend side, we are using AppSync. Uh, so all the GraphQL backend is done thanks to AppSync. And why? Because mainly uh, we didn't went to Apollo because like, we wanted like, to stay in an AWS ecosystem. And uh, AppSync offers many capabilities like uh, filtering, real time, and scalability. And uh, obviously, it has a nice integration with all the things we are already using at our call, like Elasticsearch, DynamoDB, Cognito, uh, Cognito, which is like the authentication stuff from uh, AWS. So it interacts well with all the things we have already in place. And on the Android side, uh, we didn't went for the AppSync SDK because it was like, uh, uh, like we didn't like it much and it was not really focused on the stack we were using. It was not Kotlin, still in beta. Uh, there was like a lots of difference of in terms of feature and efficiency between the Apollo SDK and the AppSync SDK. So we went for the Apollo Kotlin SDK, uh, which has like many advantages. Uh, it has a great interoperability with our Kotlin code base. Uh, the library is 100% made with Kotlin. Uh, you can generate also all the models, the queries, mutation, and stuff like that. Uh, so there's a very nice code gen tool inside the Apollo library. It had the advantage also of being multi-platform. If you are interested in the Kotlin multi-platform ecosystem, you can use uh, like the, uh, this Kotlin library to make Android iOS web app. Uh, like the, the support of query mutation subscriptions, but that's the GraphQL classic stuff. Uh, as the uh, caching system, and as a nice also interoperability with AppSync and the GraphQL support. And mainly also the community and the maintainers uh, about like Apollo is awesome. Uh, you can reach the, the maintainers and they are like quickly answered and solve the problem. And that's a, uh, that's a very good thing. So about our, our journey. So it was back then in, uh, in 2020, uh, we first introduced uh, our 
GraphQL API uh, with a new feature, with the feature of messaging. Uh, this was the, like, the start of the, the whole journey. Uh, and then, after this, uh, like building this new feature, we decided like, to break the whole monolith we have in place. So uh, it was a very long journey, and it's not done yet, because uh, there are like, many other things in parallel. Breaking the whole monolith, migrating all the, servi the, all the services, uh, building also the new modeling, uh, the, the, the new entity bundling specific for, for GraphQL, because we saw that our REST models were, were not sometimes the, like the, the best designed, so we needed like, to maybe rethink, like to, to have a very fresh start and a very good start into like, uh, what we can have exposed to the front end. And then, uh, like, uh, time to time, when like, uh, one team were ready and uh, the GraphQL uh, query mutation were exposed, we were migrating the endpoint and get rid of the REST API. Okay, so now uh, I want like, to have a bit of a focus on how you can bring Apollo into your Android application. Okay. So let's see how you can like, uh, quickly implement uh, Apollo Kotlin in your uh, Android app. Let's see the setup now. Uh, you'll see it's going to be very straightforward to have your uh, Apollo Kotlin SDK running into your Android project. Uh, and first, uh, let's see how you, you can deal with your GraphQL schema, which is like the source of truth of everything uh, you need for querying your data. Uh, it will be possible like, to query some data, make some mutation, so posting data, and have some subscription, the WebSocket part. So let's see how we can like, uh, also, uh, it's a migration, so both systems, our uh, REST client, Retrofit, can coexist with the new uh, GraphQL client, Apollo. Okay, first, you'll need like, to add some uh, like dependencies. You're going to add the, the Apollo 3 dependencies, uh, the runtime, and then you're going to set up like, your, uh, your, your package. Like, uh, uh, for us, it's com .r call, but as you want. And then, uh, you're going to get your schema. Uh, so the schema defines all the types, all the query, all the mutation, uh, so that's really the source of proof of everything. So you can also like add some documentation in that. Uh, so in a like a, uh, in a playground, you can get the documentation as well as and play with the, the schema. There is like a lot of stuff you can do with it. So to get that, uh, you're gonna use like uh, a Gradle uh, command line. Uh, you're gonna get the endpoint like uh, where your graphical schema is located, and then you will be able like to download either like uh, the schema dot graphql or uh, the, your schema as a JSON file. Up to you. And then uh, you're gonna start like creating some queries. So here, it's like you're gonna create like for example a new users dot graphql file, and you're gonna build on the, uh, a new query like uh, for example to get some working errors regarding a, a user. So we're gonna use like the query get agent and then get specific specifically what we need. Like uh, just want like to have the working hours and maybe the time zone. That's it. I don't want like a overfetching the data, I don't want to get the, the username and so on, I just want like, to focus on just the business hour, and that is possible with GraphQL. Or I can push something uh, to the server, thanks to a mutation. For example, here I just like, uh, want to mark a conversation as read, uh, so I'm just calling the mutation read conversation with my input, and then that's it. Uh, like uh, the equivalent of like a, a post request or a put in the in the rest world, and then there is like the GraphQL subscription to uh, opening a WebSocket communication from your client to uh, the uh, the server. So here yeah, I'm listening if there is like some uh, unread messages that is coming or not. So as I'm waiting for like maybe a count that has changed and so on. So uh, when my application is live, 
I'm opening the, like the communication and I'm listening uh, the data I want. Uh, and if you are using IntelliJ, uh, so if you want to have some auto-completion, deep link from what you are writing in your uh, GraphQL files, I uh, advise you like to use this plugin, which is very nice. Uh, so uh, help you uh, going like with the auto-completion, deep link, and so on. And if you are using Apollo, also uh, the Apollo team developed their own uh, like plugin, uh, which has a very nice interoperability, uh, and very focused also with the, the newest version of Apollo, the, the 4.x, which is going to be stable very soon, I think. Uh, and with this plugin, like it kind of a better implementation compared to this one. Uh, so if you're using Apollo, uh, let's go and uh, try this plugin. Okay, so for the setup, so uh, a classic like builder pattern, uh, you're gonna provide your server, your WebSocket server URL, if you have some WebSocket communication. Uh, you can provide your own uh, HTTP client. Uh, so on our side, like uh, we wanted like to add some, uh, some like uh, authenticator plus uh, monitoring the request. So we build our own HTTP client, and then uh, you call build and your Apollo client is ready to go. So you can now like make some requests. So the get agent working hours come from uh, like the, the code gen of, uh, uh, of Apollo. When you are writing your GraphQL queries, when you build your project, uh, it automatically generates all the queries, mutations, subscription you need uh, in a, like a Kotlin accessible way. Uh, so uh, you can like uh, use your client to make some queries uh, and then get uh, what you want, like uh, get uh, the result, the working hours, and so on. Okay. Now you are good to go and good to go to use like uh, uh, your Apollo Kotlin in your uh, Android app. Now uh, let's see what we learn along the way uh, through this GraphQL migration. First, Apollo love Kotlin. Uh, the one of the best things is like an Apollo is 100% Kotlin and multi-platform, so it has great support for coroutine and Kotlin flow. Uh, if you are using that for like uh, asynchronous communication, uh, it has a very nice interoperability with that. So uh, it also like generates all the code you need for your queries and mutation. Uh, you don't need like to implement it on your own or uh, like uh, generate it yourself. It's quite a great, like, uh, is the support of the, the coroutine. Like, uh, I'm in a suspend function here, and I'm gonna put my query and call the execute, which will, like, trigger, uh, like, uh, a, cor uh, a coroutine that was launched before. So, like, uh, no need, like, to add some callbacks and stuff like that. And for the flows, it's especially useful when uh, you want a more reactive way, especially for, for subscription, like, uh, which can come like at any time. So I'm gonna uh, subscribe to like the, the thing I want. Uh, calling to flow, I'm gonna uh, like, uh, catch and collect the, uh, catch the error in case of there is some, and collect. So this one I'm like, uh, okay, listening, whatever, Responses is like a launch in the uh, in the web socket. Okay, one other important thing we like uh, we saw is the cross team communication. This is like mandatory and very important. Uh, it's very important to always communicate with your backend teams to avoid like uh, surprises on the front end. Uh, we saw that along the way and very recently, where like uh, a team like push one new query mutation, and then okay, uh, it was actually missing some like. Uh, uh, some fields, some fields were not like at the right type. Uh, we were expecting like uh, non mutability on uh, like immutability on some uh, on some fields, and they didn't like uh, reach to us. So what did you expect for for this kind of query? It was like uh, okay, we're gonna make uh, our things on, uh, on 
on our on our side and just like push the new query, the new mutation to the front end and let the front end implement the things. If there is this kind of stuff, uh, it's going to be some trouble on the front side uh, and like delayed implementation. You have to rework the thing, and if we implement the thing, which in the end we found it's what not the best thing. You have like to deprecate the query and then do the work again. Wait till, especially on mobile, so uh, you cannot like uh, publish an update and everyone gets the update. You need like to wait for the client to update your application and so on. So it can take very long time like to deprecate a thing that was not like kind of ready for production uh, if it has been pushed to production. Uh, if Especially if you have a backend for front-end approach, uh, that's the best way to to deal with your uh, your GraphQL ecosystem. Uh, like uh, like that, uh, all the teams like front-end and backend like uh, are working all together to like uh, expose what really matters to the front-end apps. Uh, so, if you are on the front end side, I uh, like uh, participate in the uh, entity modeling of your uh, like uh, of the types of the query with your back end team, work all together, and uh, like uh, build all the the queries and mutation with the eyes of the front end and also the eyes of a back end team. By doing so, everyone will be on the same page and. Uh, you are like uh, avoid like some mistake in the future. Uh, next tips like beware the timeout. Uh, if you probably use some timeout for your REST API, probably don't use the same one for your GraphQL API. Uh, think you with your backend teams uh, and other client teams, for example, uh, to identify the best time timeout for your client. Uh, and if you are using okay, a HTTP, so our like uh, HTTP client, uh, don't use the same one for retrofit uh, your REST client and for your GraphQL client. For example, the like the, the tech under the hood, uh, when you are using your REST API, you know. Uh, the backend communicates with maybe other microservices or directly hit the database and so on. That's the implementation. And on the GraphQL side, things might be different. If you are targeting like uh, the replacement of one endpoint, the tech under the hood with the resolver and other things like uh, uh, the GraphQL resolver might go to another database, uh, communicate to maybe another microservices. So you don't expect to be the same timeout kind of if the request is quite long. So uh, think about that and don't use the same timeout for your REST API and the GraphQL one. Uh, quick tip for like a very focused on the right thing. Use the lazy loading, especially when you are migrating. So at some point, you don't need that instance of Apollo. So you can delay uh, the, the instance creation to the very last moment. Uh, especially if one of the, the features that is using GraphQL is like under a feature flag or on so on. So at, at some point, even like n some clients doesn't need uh, the, the, the GraphQL thing at the moment. So we need like to delay at the very moment the creation of the instance. So uh, with Dagger Hilt, you can like uh, expose a lazy interface which will create uh, the Apollo client when we actually want it. Also, very important thing, monitoring. Uh, e either if you are on a develop, develop or production environment, you always need to monitor your request, like uh, especially to uh, identify slow queries, uh, like uh, bad, bad queries that is not well formatted and so on. So you can take advantage of the OKHttp OK interceptor if you are going with the OKHttp OK with, uh, with uh, your HTTP client to monitor the queries and mutation. And to do so, on our side, we use a tool called, called a checker in dev mode to monitor our request and it allows like to, to pinpoint if there, is, there are some uh, so slow requests or some uh, issues with some uh, other requests. 
If you would like to have a deep dive into the latest version of Chucker, I advise you to check out the talk of Nicola Corti uh, done at DroidCon Berlin last year. So to monitor like the, uh, what is happening with GraphQL on our application, uh, only on, on the dev side here, uh, we need like to uh, instantiate the, the checker collector. So you define a bunch of, uh, of parameters, and then you're going to create the checker interceptor with the collector. If you want like to redact some uh, sensible headers, like the auto token, behavior, and so on, you can do, you can do it. And then uh, we're going to inject this interceptor into our HTTP client. And to do so, better see a demo on that. So I have my running device here. Up. I have my Pixel 7. Uh, tuk, 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 tuk. Uh, let's hide this when I don't need it. Okay, so this is our like a checker, uh, checker activity when we can monitor everything that happens on our, our application. So it can be REST and GraphQL. So the, the latest improvement, you can see the, the nice GraphQL logo. So you can see every single GraphQL query mutation that has been triggered in the on the app. And if you don't see like, the, the GraphQL logo, that's a REST, uh, REST thing. Uh, so for example, uh, you can see that uh, like this response is complete. Uh, the time was like uh, uh, not so bad, but could be improved. Uh, and you can check also uh, what's going on on the response side and see there are some errors, if uh, what you are expecting is the right thing, and so on. So uh, the only thing that could be improved uh, if it's just monitoring mutation and queries, but not um, subscription. Subscription is handled uh, by like a, a different part of Apollo. Uh, if you need so, you need like to override yourself, uh, for example, <laughs> We did it for our uh, AppSync protocol, so we kind of uh, override and implement our own AppSync protocol to put some uh, first some um, ah, uh, authentication, like custom authentication, and to monitor everything that happens uh, when the WebSocket communication is open. Uh, on paper, uh, so uh, we had to provide our own thing to monitor and pass our custom authentication. All right. Uh, one of the great things of GraphQL is the nested queries. But with great power comes great responsibilities. Why? You'll see why. GraphQL offers like, uh, this uh, nice support of nested queries, so you can call multiple queries at the same time, uh, which is really good like, to, to fetch multiple things into a single request. It's pretty efficient when uh, aggregating uh, this like, whole data, but the response time might increase a lot if you are doing that. So always monitor when you are especially doing some like, uh, nested queries, Always monitor like this big query you are you are doing to your backend. So if you are spot if you spot a very slow request when aggregating multiple data, sync with your backend to find the best solution. For example, uh, here we wanted like to have a list of conversation. Uh, so this is like the simple request of uh, like querying a list of conversation with the conversation and some data in that. And at some point, we needed to access the uh, latest message of that conversation to display that thing into a list. Uh, that was the requirement of the product and so on. So say, okay, we were able like to access the list of messages inside the, the list conversation. But by doing so, we increase the query, uh, like in the development environment, uh, it was like uh, between seven and 10 seconds, which is like not very good for the end user. Uh, 
uh, waiting like 10 seconds to get a list of messages, that's it's not production ready at all. So uh, we had like to uh, tell the backending, okay, uh, we need like to do something. We cannot like push things like that in production, and it's not possible. So uh, we decided like to, to pinpoint the, to work on that problem, and uh, we pinpoint the, the like the, the issue on the backend side. So they improve the communication on their own, and they kind of also rework to have like a very nice implementation. On the on the backend side, so they expose just like a feed, the last message, which uh, could be could have like this one could have been the, the same thing, uh, but they really optimized the thing on the backend side. Could have said the same, but they decided like to like uh, it's good like, also to work on the developer experience. Like uh, if you have access to a less message, it's much more better to work with that than that. And with that, we have an optimized query. So if you pinpoint some stuff, always communicate with your backend teams. And one very important thing also is the subscription. Subscriptions are very cool, but you can get some surprise with that. And it's not very straightforward, especially with AppSync. When you are dealing with your client, which is Apollo, with a backend that runs on AppSync, <laughs> subscription can be sometimes tricky. Okay, so subscription are like a long uh, listing operation, so many a web socket. Uh, the data is pushed to the socket and listened on the client side. And keeping that connection alive, especially on a mobile environment, is not easy at all. And uh, things might get a bit more complicated with AppSync. Spoiler alert. We had to build our own AppSync protocol to kind of handle the uh, like the refresh token on our own. Uh, so let's see how we did it. So at first, when uh, there was some like issue, we asked the uh, like the, the maintainer of Apollo how we could do it if we find there is an error. How we can can we like. Uh, Retrigger and uh, reopen the, communi the, the communication between the client and the, and the backend, uh, so we can get the actual data. And uh, there was some stuff uh, we saw, like there is some like a, a, a web token reopen when uh, lambda that was exposed in the builder, and this define the logic uh, to like kind of restart the, the web socket, uh, all the web socket that is like handled by, uh, by uh, par, uh, Apollo, Apollo. So for example, if uh, there is an Apollo authentication exception, or uh, if the attempt is like below three, uh, I don't do anything. If it's above, I'm killing the, the web socket. So, when we saw that, we saw like, okay, Apollo exception, how we can trigger that thing? And to do that, uh, when uh, we were waiting like a, for a new refresh socket to restart the web socket, uh, so the web socket has, like, uh, would be aware of the new token. Uh, when we have the new, uh, like the, the new token, we call GraphQL close connection. Which is a bit of a, of a weird thing because, like, uh, it's actually a close and reopen connection. Uh, there's like a, a, a naming issue here, but when we like uh, saw that, it was a bit tricky because uh, when we were refreshing the, the web socket, uh, we saw some stuff that was not quite uh, like. 100% proof. <laughs> uh, we were investigating some disconnection, and uh, we saw an open issue on the repository. Uh, and we saw that uh, the Apollo team was not working on that, and it was specifically what we wanted. Uh, so we asked the, the team, OK, do you have an estimation time for this issue that will be fixed maybe in a few days, weeks, months, years? Uh, 
but they like uh, they said like they didn't have the bandwidth yet, so why not doing our own contribution to Apollo? You know, Apollo is open source, so why not contributing and fix our issue ourselves? So to handle the best the, the kind of refresh token push to the uh, WebSocket server, we saw like uh, this was a plain function here. Uh, it's push once, it's defined, and we cannot like kind of refresh this URL or uh, to do it, we had to reset the, the client, which was not the best thing to do. Uh, uh, restarting the client just to refresh a token, uh, like a, a token for our uh, WebSocket URL was not the best thing to do. So uh, we thought like, uh, what if we expose the Lambda uh, that is like a trigger every time we need like to uh, refresh the token. So we came with uh, that approach. Uh, we start of building the like uh, the improvement on the uh, Apollo client SDK, uh, and it was actually a very nice thing. Uh, so an ongoing development, we did it on our own. We push a merge request from like uh, uh, our own branch to uh, the Apollo SDK, review by the maintainer, and in a few let's say days weeks. This was approved and merged into uh, a new version of Apollo. So, uh, even if the maintainers don't have bandwidth, you can I, I like uh, advise you to contribute to that project. Maintainers are uh, like uh, very friendly and very helpful in terms of, uh, especially if you want to, like to go and contribute yourself to fix an issue, uh, they will uh, they will help you uh, with those issues. Okay, uh, one more thing, the error handling, uh, which is like not straightforward with uh, with GraphQL, and there's like many sources of truth, uh, and very different from the, the REST API. Error can be exposed in a very multiple and different way. Uh, so inquiry imitation can be uh, accessible directly in the Apollo response, or uh, like the client can throw an exception. And inside the Apollo response, uh, you are like have access to a list of potential errors. Uh, so multiple source of truth, multiple error parsing. Uh, uh, oops, uh, this can lead like to okay. Uh, I'm gonna parse the data. Okay, check if there are some nullability. If it's null, that's something that went wrong. If the data, the whole thing is null, I'm gonna check in the uh, result error if like uh, something is null here, or like uh, if there are some error that has been triggered by the GraphQL uh, resolver. And then also I need to listen if there is like some exception that has been thrown when executing the mutation. So you are like doing some uh, error parsing at multiple level, and that's. Uh, multiple source of truth for any error and was not the great thing to do. Maybe it can come from the cache, from the network, uh, can, from the forum, can come from this list of errors, multiple things. And this is kind of work in progress on our side, but we found some stuff interesting, like uh, with Apollo 4, it actually makes the thing a bit more better in terms of uh, like uh, developer experience. And also on our side, uh, we worked with all the backend teams like to unify a bit the error handling system. So we define some kind of exception regarding like the uh, whatever error can be triggered when uh, querying or uh, making a mutation, and uh, we define some exception that could be triggered. And with that, uh, for example, here to, to create a pre-recorded message, uh, we are exposing different exceptions. So thanks to the union type of uh, Apollo, we can tell, OK, uh, when I'm fetching this one, I can get either a pre-recorded message or an exception or a, a resource not found exception, for example. Uh, the union temp, like uh, it's kind of a, a when inside your uh, like 
inside your, uh, your, your query or your mutation. Uh, by that, you can expect different type of uh, response. But you cannot get like uh, two at the same time. It's either one of, it, uh, one of these uh, fragments. So by doing so, uh, we improved a bit like the uh, like the, the experience of handling uh, and dealing with the errors. So we kind of like uh, clean the way we are dealing with uh, with exception with Apollo. Uh, that was a bit of a, of a very nice improvement here. Uh, now I want to talk about that like the, the schema automation. At some points, you're going to need like, to automate the GraphQL schema update because uh, you are on your application and you can, cannot like, go and fetch yourself uh, the schema every time. So you, we have uh, some automation tools that can do that. So let's see how we did it. Uh, especially if like, the backend teams are pushing a lot of things uh, with GraphQL, you get more, more updates, more stuff, so you need like, to automate, aut automate the thing. And especially on Android, if you're working with multiple flavors, uh, which means like, you have, for example, maybe a dev environment, a QA environment, and a production environment, you can like, deal with three different schema, because like, uh, the schema on the dev side might not be the same as the one in production. So, uh, like, the more environment you have, the more schema you have. So let's see how we manage that with our CI. Uh, so we have this uh, job, and we are using uh, GitLab CI here. Uh, we have, a, like, a, a pool GraphQL schema job. Uh, and with AppSync, we can access, like, the, the schema regarding the environment we are. Uh, so here, for example, we are, like, uh, getting, like, the the GraphQL schema based on our like, development environment. And then uh, we fetch the, the, the GraphQL schema JSON and we run a little script that will open like, a pull request every morning uh, to say, OK, uh, we spot some changes in the schema. So we're going to open a, a GraphQL review. And the job is going to run, the, like, uh, all the jobs going to be running like, to check if there are some breakage changes and so on. Uh, so every morning we have like a, um, a pull request that has been pushed by our CI, uh, and we check if there is like a, if there is a failure in the like the, the world building process. Uh, we check if we can fix it on our own, and if if there is uh, like a schema issue, we talk to the backend team and uh, say, okay, what happened with the schema? Maybe there is something wrong on your side, and so on. So with that, no need to fetch on our own the, the schema. We just like do it easily. And when you are dealing with uh, multiple flavors, you will have multiple man uh, schema to maintain. And this can be much more error prone if you are doing it on your own. OK, just uh, last one thing about the Apollo community. Uh, I very advise you if you are doing stuff with Apollo to uh, go and like tell talk anything, uh, say hi to the maintainer, ask questions if you have issues and so on. In the Kotlin Slack, in the uh, repository, they are very kin kind to uh, like, uh, answer anything. Uh, they are very active, so if you want like, to uh, make some improvement, uh, ask for new features and so on, uh, they are very open-minded for, for that, so don't hesitate to reach them, uh, either on Slack or the Kotlin Slack. And also, they are developing a very, a lots of stuff and improvement with uh, Apollo, Apollo 4. So uh, can't wait like, to see, the, see it uh, stable and live. Uh, just to finish, uh, quick takeaways. Uh, what it was the right move for us like to move from REST to, to GraphQL? Uh, first, like uh, dealing with a uh, 100% Kotlin stack, uh, Apollo. So it's perfect for that. It's a very easy integration uh, on, a, on our like, uh, end uh, client side. Great support for coroutine and flows. Uh, so if you are doing some asynchronous job, uh, what will you do with your Kotlin code base? That's the best way to, to do it. 
one of the main advantages is the strong typing. So you don't have the, the surprise if you, if you don't have any rest uh, documentation. So you know the contract, you know what you are getting, um, you know in the end everything that is in your schema. The combined query is important, but uh, sometimes uh, you need to, do, to work on the thing. And the Apollo communities and the Apollo maintainers are gold uh, for GraphQL. The rest watch uh, the co collaboration between the backend teams. So uh, you always need to think, and uh, especially if you are on the backend for frontend uh, mentality. The error handling, uh, even if we improve the thing, thing, we still have some work to do on that, uh, like to have a very clean way of handling errors. Subscription aren't always reliable, especially when you have uh, an Apollo client and uh, an AppSync backend. Uh, sometimes it can be a bit tricky. And uh, yeah, the, the obviously with that the AppSync support support of uh, of Apollo sometimes is a bit uh, a bit tricky to do. A uh, few resources to, to, to finish, like the the classic one, the, the documentation about uh, Apollo, GraphQL, and so on. Uh, they are doing a GraphQL summit every year, so I'm um, advise you that like, if you are interested in the GraphQL uh, like the community. Technology, see the, the videos, they are very nice and you can learn a lot of stuff about that. Uh, if you are on the AWS stack and you want to have a look at AppSync, the documentation is there. And if you want to have a look at the AppSync SDK as well, to say, okay, I would still want like, to compare the AppSync SDK between the Apollo SDK. Uh, let's go and find what's best suit you. All right, so that was pretty much for me. And I uh, hope you will have fun with GraphQL. And uh, if you have, have any questions, it's like three minutes left. And there for you. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I have uh, actually two questions. The first one is about um, security because you expose a lot. And then this is up to the developer to choose what he wants to use. And there is less segregation in what is allowed and what is not allowed. Um, because here you speak uh, between backend and frontend as like one team, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's two different teams. They have two, dif two different um, priorities. And, um, and sometimes backend, they don't want every developer to have access to the same, or even the end user to have to access to the same information mm -hmm. or rights. And the other one is the versioning of the API of, of the. Mm -mm. Yeah, like, um, well, it's really a matter of communication. Like, uh, what is exposing, like, for us in the, our internal API, we don't get access to everything. Like, uh, we define actually, like, uh, it's part of the entity modeling. So, when we want, like, to make a new query, we define, okay, uh, what actually this query want to do, and uh, what in the end we need as a back end, uh, as a front end team, we need this set of data, okay? And uh, on the back end side, they say, okay, uh, if you want, like, to, if you need this, you have access to that, but uh, there won't be any extra stuff for this kind of query. For example, we have like a different entity modeling for our front-end apps, uh, like uh, Android, iOS, and the uh, web app. Sometimes the modeling is different from our dashboard, because uh, we don't have the same needs uh, in terms of uh, like, uh, like uh, displaying some data that is like only needed for the dashboard or only needed for the... Uh, ah for the client side, part of the, of the application. So yeah, it's always a, like a, a matter of communication, but it can be hard sometimes, uh, I'm agree with that. Uh, sometimes you don't like, especially if backend team like uh, expose some stuff, which don't want to. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, you have to agree on that. Sometimes, yeah, there is some flaws in the system. And for the, the versioning, there's no, you cannot like, say, okay, there is like a V1, V2, like rest. Uh, you have to take advantage of the deprecated queries. Uh, you can mark in your uh, schema, 
some uh, queries mark as deprecated or some field mark as deprecated, and you need to monitor this deprecated usage in your uh, client, uh, client apps. So at some point, if like, uh, you don't see at least very low usage or maybe like, uh, you don't see any usage of this query mutation deprecated field, you can now remove them from, uh, from the graph and push uh, a new update uh, of your uh, GraphQL schema. But uh, it can be very long like, to deprecate or, uh, and remove uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, yes. Last one. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. You mentioned that you um, split the monolith, so how did the front end communicate with it? Did you have one endpoint that stitched all the schemas together, or did you have, does the front end communicate with the different uh, microservices individually? Uh, now they went like, to, um, to the federated, uh, federated GraphQL Uh, stuff on the backend side, so each team push their their own uh, like mm, like microservice uh, made with GraphQL, and it's federated. Then in the end, we have access to a big file uh, with all the the GraphQL federation stuff. Uh, but each team on their own field uh, might push uh, a tiny GraphQL schema to deal with their own uh, like uh, part of the system. So. Uh, Uh, there are multiple things like uh, on our side messaging, users, numbers, and so on. So everyone pushing their own uh, li little part of the system. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll be staying around. Like if you have any questions, you can. So, thank you.